everybody, I'm really thrilled to be here to give you this ALS update. So here are the objective of the session. We're gonna, of course, identify ALS manifestation based on the up-to-date diagnostic criteria. We'll incorporate finding from recent clinical study into patient care, including trial opportunity. We'll anticipate changes in treatment based on emerging strategy and approved therapy. And we'll talk about a few resources at the end of the session. Well, the, you guys are all familiar with this. Just a quick reminder that ALS is due to the degeneration of the motor neuron. It is a neurodegenerative disease that leads with, to weakness um, and unfortunately disability and death. The epidemiology of ALS has not changed in its prevalence is a little bit shy of the 10 per 10,000, uh, 10 patient per 10,000 and at Every single time we could think that there, there is about 30,000 patients with ALS. That's how I try to remember it. It's closer to 28,000, but it's easy to remember 30,000. It is more common among male that are white and in the sex decade. And although ALS is most commonly sporadic, 10% of the patient have a positive family history. It can happen at any age. We had patient as young as 17, 16, and patient as old as 90 years old. Um, but most commonly, it starts between the age of 51 and 66. As you know, ALS has no cure. It is a deadly disease with lifespan, lifespan being about three to five years from symptom onset. About 30% of the patient can live more than five years, and that's for due to the heterogeneity of the disease. 10 to 20% of the patient can live more than 10 years. And of course, um, disease span and survival above 20 years have been um, observed, but they're extremely rare. As I said earlier, the majority of ALS patients have a sporadic form of the disease, but in 10% of the cases, the disease could be familial. It inherited usually as an autosomal dominant disease, and there are more than 25 genes that cause ALS. However, the most common one is C9 ORF72. It's responsible of 40% of the familial ALS. It is followed by SOD1, causing about 13 to 20% of the familial ALS. It is really thanks to the different genes that have been discovered in the past two to three decades that we have a better understanding of the pathophysiology of ALS. It is extremely, extremely complex, and I don't know, I don't think that we have um, a clear understanding of the steps that are put in place that cause motor neuron degeneration. We have idea, we do understand certain pathway are involved thanks to the different genes that are um, being discovered to be involved in this disease. But really something interesting happened in 2006 with the discovery of TDP43. TDP43 is a really a nuclear protein involved in RNA processes that in ALS patient and FTD patient, it is depleted from the nucleus and accumulates in the aggregate that are present in the cytoplasm of the motor neuron and cortical neuron of patient with either ALS or FTD. In over the years, we've been debating is the depletion of TDP from the nucleus that is causing ALS, or is it its accumulation in the cytoplasm that is the culprit? It's a little bit of both, but uh, uh, in 2019, there was an interesting discovery um, in um, we are able to understand the role of TDP43 better thanks to its role um, with the splicing of cryptic exon. 
So what are cryptic exons? These are pieces of DNA that creep into the mature mRNA. Normally, there are, they are spliced out thanks to the presence of TDP43 in the nucleus. But um, when TDP43 is depleted, they do make their way into the mature mRNA. They can cause a stop codon or a frame uh, disruption and decrease gene expression that way. There are two protein that are very important. Of course, I mean, it's not the, this TDP43 depletion and cryptic exon are present in many other protein, but two protein are, are important to mention. One is statin 2 and statin 2 is a microtubule associated protein that is important for um, neuronal development and repair. And ONC13A, which is very important for synaptic transmission and if you remember, UNC13A has been um, has been found as a risk factor for ALS in a uh, genome-wide association study. So this link from TDP43 to uh, the presence of cryptic exon decreasing the level of certain genes like a statin 2 and ONC13A, for example, is important because there is a study that is, there is actually multiple study. There is one that is directly targeting statin 2 expression using an antisense oligonucleotide. There is also a study using lithium in uh, Europe that is targeting patients with polymorphism in ONC13A. So you can see how these really better understanding of the pathophysiology of ALS is allowing us to do precision therapy. And also these cryptic exons may be used in the future as biomarker of disease progression or response to therapy. You all know that it's the loss of the motor neuron that is responsible for the clinical sign and symptom of ALS. And um, the disease can manifest with either barbar involvement, cervical, thoracic, or lumbosacral. But really what we want to see is the presence of upper and lower, lower motor neuron dysfunction. But sometimes the disease could start with respiratory involvement. It's extremely rare. One percent of the cases patient can present with respiratory involvement. It makes the diagnosis a little bit difficult. However, respiratory involvement is what patient end up having either through the weakness of the respiratory muscle or um, through, unfortunately, the development of uh, pulmonary complication through dysphagia and aspiration and the development of pneumonia. Sometimes upper motor neuron dysfunction at the barbar level is a little bit difficult to uh, diagnose, but it can be present as what we call a pseudo barbar affect, which are these episodes of crying spell or laughing spell. And of course, the LS patients don't make more saliva, but because they cannot swallow their saliva, they end up having hypersaluria, and um, which is um, really has a very bad impact on patient quality of life. And finally, frontotemporal dementia could happen with ALS, but if we take really um, more time to study patient and do a very uh, neuropsych testing, we can find cognitive dysfunction up to half the patient with ALS. And you all know um, about the ALS diagnostic criteria. You are also very aware that uh, really there is a problem with ALS, which is the uh, delay in diagnosis. You know, from the symptom onset to actually diagnosis of ALS, it takes about a year, and this number is the same all across the world. Most patients see ALS patient in ALS clinic after a year of symptom onset. It may be a little bit faster if the disease is fast progressing or a little bit slower if the disease is slower but that's what we see. And we really cannot do that anymore. I mean, it was okay back in the early 90s and 2000 when we did not have therapies, but nowadays we have to work at um, really diagnosing ALS quicker. It's very important. So you are aware of the ls Coreal criteria developed in the 90, early 90s, and then they were um, revised in 2000 and then in 2008. And these um, criteria are sometimes a little bit difficult and they do 
they are based on putting the patient in buckets, suspected, possible, probable, um, definite. They they don't, they're not very sensitive. And uh, sometimes you can see that patients do progress, but they may not change category. Patient progress, but they will stay in the probable category for a long time. They're very difficult also to, um, I mean, they're prone to error. They're difficult between, I mean, there is poor enter rate or reliability. And um, sometimes there is the potential of patient thinking that may not have ALS, telling them you have possible ALS, they may think they're at risk and not having it. And really to make this as easier, um, the ALS uh, community, ALS expert and stakeholder have met um, through a consensus meeting in the Gold Coast in 2019 in Australia, and they tried to come up with a way that make the diagnosis of ALS simpler. And really, if you think about it, um, there are three major points for the Gold Coast criteria. First of all, we know that by definition, ALS is a progressive disease. So if it's not progressive, it's probably not ALS. Second, you really need the presence of upper and lower motor neuron at the same segment, which is easy kind of to, to tell. And um, third, you want to make sure to rule out anything that may look like ALS, like ALS through um, really a detailed uh, investigation. And, and when they were polled, I mean, ALS experts are very, they have a high sensitivity in the, for the ALS diagnosis. They can diagnose ALS accurately in 96% of the cases. And many studies have been done after cross-sectional study that showed that the cold coast criteria are really sensitive uh, without changing the specificity um, of uh, diagnosing ALS. I mean, I hope we get to use them in the uh, clinical trial going forward. One other way to diagnose ALS early is to perform genetic testing. Um, you see the list of uh, genes involved in ALS is growing. There is, as I said earlier, more than 25 genes involved. There is an opportunity now for a sponsored testing which makes genetic testing um, accessible to all patients. But we have to be careful and offer genetic testing when we have the possibility to also offer genetic counseling uh, it may be difficult to interpret the results, especially if we they come back as variant of a known significance, and and patients need to be counseled on ways to understand the implication of a positive genetic test on the person and the family. So it's very very important to have access to genetic counseling uh, with the gen with the free genetic testing that we can do now. So this is really my favorite slide of the deck. If you look back. Over here, for a long time, we only had one drug available, but look at the end here. We have many, many options. This is really um, very exciting. So, Riluzol has been the only drug we had for a long time. About 20 years later, Radicava showed up, um, which is the second drug to be approved. Radicava was um, great to have, but the problem of the IV infusion, it was heart to even though patients were willing, it was there were many logistics that we have to and hoops to jump through to make this drug available for these for our patient. But uh, it is interesting to see that just um, this past year, all these development with the approval of the second with the oral form of Radicava, the presence of Relibrio, and then finally Calsodi. So we have multiple options. This is really very exciting. So just to go over, so last May, the FDA approved the oral form of Adirabone based on um, the study that showed bioequivalence. It is really very easier for our patient now. They don't have to have any IV infusion. They have access to an oral form. They still have to use it um, on and off the same way they used IV radicava. And last uh, September, we had FDA approved through Librio for ALS patient based on the phase two studies showing indifference in ALS FRS between the uh, patient on placebo and patient receiving active drug, but also patient in the open label extension that showed really a difference in survival between the patient who've been on the Librio throughout versus the one who started it after the, um, the end of the placebo controlled portion. 
And this is really the last kind of get on the block, the approval of the first one or Calsodi. Um, this is really interesting. This is precision medicine. It is targeting patient with SOD1 mutation. This study um, was a placebo controlled randomized study with, that used an enrichment method where they really selected patient added like on top of the patient with SOD mutation, there was a cohort that had rapid progressive um, disease. And the primary endpoint was the change in ALS FRS at the end of the 28 week period. The secondary endpoint were the change in SOD1 and NFL and other um, clinical outcome measures. So you can see here that uh, really at the end of the 28 weeks, um, these data have, has been published last September, uh, but presented at the ANA conference in October. And I remember the first time seeing this up to the 28 week period and being really blown away because this is where we see that the level of SOD1 does drop within 12 weeks of starting treatment. You can see it drop and it stays uh, stable and you can see the patient and placebo have like have I mean it doesn't drop but then when they are switched in the open label portion of the study it they will um, their LCD level will stop so the red are the patient who have who are receiving to first and throughout the green or the blue are the ones who um, are placebo but switched after 28 weeks to the active uh, to the first and so this really represents that the drug is doing what it's supposed to. It's decreasing the level of SOD1 in the spinal fluid. It also showed that the within the same period of time, between 12 and 16 weeks, we could see that the neurofilament level also drop in the patient who are receiving to person, and the level in the placebo arm will drop once they start on active drug. Um, so this is really very interesting. Um, unfortunately, at the end of the 28 week period, if you look at the clinical result, it seems that the clinical difference takes a longer time to appear. At 28 weeks, there was no change in the ALS, no significant change in the ALS FRS between the two group. However, if you continue the study and you observe patient longer up to a year, you could see that the difference between the two arm starts to appear and grow. And we see the same thing in all the other secondary outcome. Actually, in the handheld dynamometry, you could see that the uh, patient in the placebo group that started to first one, not only do they have kind of stabilization, but you can see it go up a little bit, which is um, really interesting. And you can see it here in the patient who've been on drug the whole time, they are doing a little bit better. So you can see the difference between the two arm. It takes a longer time, it seems, for the clinical phenotype to uh, or for, for the function to, rep to repair. Now, when you look at the survival, there weren't many deaths, so it's difficult to kind of have any conclusion about that. I know this is sometimes confusing, and I had patients reach out to me, say, well, how come the drug was approved and this is a negative trial? The drug was approved really based on the uh, it's an accelerated approval, and it was approved based on the secondary outcome and the fact that neurofilament is a surrogate for um, for uh, neuronal degeneration, and the fact that it's decreasing neurofilament is really significant. The drug was overall well tolerated. The most common adverse event was really the post-LP headache, but we have to remember that 7% of the patient had severe neurological um, side effect. They had chemical meningitis or aseptic meningitis, and they had myelitis or increased intracranial pressure. We do um, the... the um, um, package insert does not require us to follow the protein and the... Um, level in the white cells in the spinal fluid, but we are doing it just to make sure that we don't miss in case there is a jump in protein and in cells that may uh, tell us that there is um, an aseptic meningitis, for example. It is rare though, and when you stop the treatment, they, they would recover. So based on the success of the first one, would it be nice if we have a way to actually prevent ALS from even appearing, from even manifesting? And this idea is what the ATLAS study is all about. Can we 
target patient pre-symptomatic to ALS because they do carry a, a mutation in SOD1 gene, treat them, follow them prospectively, and when their neurofilament increase or reaches a threshold, treat them with the first one and see if we can either delay the manifestation or make sure that they're as minimal as possible. So the ATLAS study has multiple phases. Uh, phase A is when we follow the patient prospectively using neurofilament. If the neurofilament reach a threshold, we'll enroll them in part B, where they are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive uh, tofersen versus placebo. It's uh, double blind. And after uh, 28 weeks, they will graduate to part C, where, where they will receive tofersen. This study is ongoing. So if you do have access to patient to family with SOD1, please encourage patient to uh, reach out. It is targeting highly penetrant, fast progressing mutation in um, SOD1. So because it's in these cohort of mutation that the trajectory of neurofilament has been shown to kind of predict outcome. And, and really, this is only the beginning of using um, antisense oligonucleotide in the treatment of ALS, whether they're familial or um, sporadic. So, for example, there is a trial, ION363, sponsored by IONIS, that is targeting FUS mRNA. FUS is a rare form of ALS that is really can cause um, severe uh, juvenile ALS that is really devastating with very rapid progression in six months, patient go from normal to almost kind of um, tetraplegic. Um, so this study is currently ongoing. And then in sporadic patient, we know that ataxin 2 is a risk factor. Um, intermediate repeat in ataxin 2 is a risk factor for ALS. So this study is sponsored by Biogen is targeting sporadic patient with or without um, any change in the ataxin 2 gene. So please go to clinicaltrial.gov, see that is, if there is a site close to you and do refer patient to these studies. Um, the, the quicker we finish the studies, the quicker we'll learn if these treatments will work or not. And, and really, finally, can we think in a different way about doing clinical trial in ALS? Can we change the paradigm? And this comes, this is where the doing platform trial in ALS comes from. So the Healy platform trial is the first platform trial in ALS. This platform concept has been successful in finding treatment in breast cancer. It's been tested in glioblastoma, many other um, in oncology and other neurological diseases. So this is like a multi-center placebo control, uh, perpetual adaptive device, uh, adaptive, adapted, um, adaptive trial, design trial, that is supposed to be open until a cure for ALS is found. And, um, and it helps to test multiple drugs in parallel. And we know that recently in the past, past few years, there was an increased interest of pharmaceutical company in ALS, and this will allow for a faster um, answer to these to this compound. So the platform kind of design can shorten the money, the the, the cost of trials by thirty percent. It can decrease the time of trial by fifty percent and increase patient participation by up to like sixty to seventy percent. Um, and also it will allow for sharing placebo. So the ratio will be three to one. This is what patients like, not having to be on in a study that has like one-to-one -one placebo, being on three-to-one is very, very helpful. It will, all the regimen will follow the same design. They would be through an RCT period of six months, followed by an open label extension. And, and really, it's if you look at it, it is mind boggling that this study was launched in the middle of the pandemic in July of 2020. And so far, like three years later, we have uh, an answer. We stopped a regimen for fertility, which is important, knowing early that a drug doesn't work instead of waiting years to have that answer. Um, another drug, unfortunately, uh, failed. But then two compounds are going for subsequent testing. 
uh, one is still an RCT and then two are, um, are, be, are actually um, enrolling right now and the last regimen age is in design. So this is a very supposed to be an efficient way of really looking at identifying drug that will either will work right away and will go through registration trial or will go for uh, a phase three trial. Or if they don't work, we'll know that very fast as well, which is very important. So with that, I think it gives me it brings me to this resource slide. Um, and uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you.